Greetings and welcome back to 303. And we turn now in your hymnals in our junior English class to page 846, 847 and the Eudora Welty offering, A Worn Path. Uh, there's so many ways to begin a conversation about this title. Uh, a number of years ago in 303, we had a different high school junior anthology. And at the beginning of that anthology, they wanted to kind of introduce you to how to read a text. And so they selected one text out of all of the possible texts in the American literary tradition to be representative of a great text. And <laughs> Warren Path was the one that they selected. And I remember assigning the text one year at the very beginning of the school year and having a student come in and say, that has to be one of the most boring stories I've ever read. And because we allow for a certain kind of candid honesty in 303, I said, well, let me see if I can somehow make the story come alive or have some meaning for you. Let's go ahead and just say it out loud. Eudora Welty, and you see her dates right there on 847. She's born in 1909 and she dies in 2001. That is a remarkable amount of time to live. Can we just say that out loud? Given that this is going to be a story about an old woman, okay, it I think needs to be celebrated that Eudora Welty lived a long life, eight years away from living to be a hundred years old. Think about then all of the things she lived through if she was born in 1909, right? So it's kind of benchmark dates, right? So how old was she in 1914 at the beginning of the Great War, in 1918 at the end of the Great War, at the beginning of the Second World War? You can just go through the 20th century and kind of plot her dates. Let's read something about her. Eudora Welty's, I'm, I'm reading on 847. Eudora Welty's stories and novels capture life in the Deep South, creating images of the landscape and conveying the shared attitudes and values of the people. Like Faulkner, she shares a passion for America's Deep South. While she often confronts the hardships of life in poor rural areas and depicts people suffering, her writing remains optimistic. And so let's put that in our notes as well. We said before the Catherine Ann Porter offering that many of the writers of the 20th century struggle with a certain kind of disillusionment. The idea being that terrible things are happening in the world, it's really hard to have much hope. The reason, for example, that Faulkner in his Nobel Prize speech said something about the need for hope is because obviously people struggle to try and find the optimism and the hope that would make their lives meaningful. Welty well, remain optimistic in her, in her offerings. We will see this brilliantly displayed in A Worn Path. Keep reading. Welty was born in Jackson, Mississippi, where she spent most of her life. That'll be an interesting fact given the name of the heroine of our story, Phoenix Jackson. She attended Mississippi State College for Women before transferring to the University of Wisconsin, where she graduates in 1929, hoping to pursue a career in advertising. One more writer who comes out of that maybe interest in journalism and the like. She moved to New York City, enrolled at Columbia University School of Business. However, because of the worsening economic depression, she was unable to find steady employment returns to Jackson in 1931. The next heading, traveling and writing. After accepting a job as a publicist for a government agency, similar to journalism, Welty spent several years traveling through Mississippi taking photographs interviewing people. Her experiences inspired her to write, and in 1936 her first short story, Death of a Traveling Salesman, was published. In her fiction, Welty displays an acute sense of detail. I would write that down at level 2B. We're going to see it here in a second. An acute sense of detail. And, as well, notice a deep sense of compassion towards her characters. You're going to see this with her portrayal of Phoenix Jackson here in a moment. For example, in A Worn Path, she paints a sympathetic portrait of an old woman whose feelings of love and sense of duty motivate her to make a long, painful journey through the countryside. One of the leading American <laughs> writers of the 20th century, Welty, published numerous collections of short stories and novels in 1973. Her novel, The Optimist's Daughter, won the Pulitzer Prize. Let's turn over now to 846, and let's talk a little bit about the <coughs> literary analysis stuff that we are going to be looking at. Now, you see it right there in bold, so let's write it down. 
That word, by the way, and the way we say that word is archetype. Read it with me on 846. Archetype. And what we mean by this word is a plot structure or a character type, a symbol or an idea that reoccurs in the literature or mythology of many different cultures across the world. Now let's pause for a moment and talk about the journey. Let's talk about the hero's quest. And let's talk about the ways in which 20th century writers begin to play games with the most classic motif in literature. So let's take a few notes now. We can be working right now with 2B because we're talking about a certain understanding of a type of story. A motif <coughs> is a type of story. Now what are we talking about? The most ancient story type in the Western tradition, some have argued in the history of the world, um, Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, argued it this way. The most ancient type of story is the journey motif. I would write this down. The journey motif. Of course, the most famous example of the journey motif is the most famous epic poem of the journey motif, Homer's Odyssey. A story about the great <coughs> hero Odysseus who takes his long journey after he leaves the walls of Troy after 20 years of fighting, after 10 years of fighting at the walls of Troy. For another 10 years, he takes this long, epic journey. Now let's define that journey really quickly <coughs> with several observations. One, the journey has to involve a hero. I would write all this down. The journey has to involve a hero, what we will call an epic hero. What defines an epic hero? Well, two things. One, epic struggle, conflict, fighting. Odysseus has to fight against all of these monsters. He has to fight against Scylla and Charybdis. He has to fight against the one-eyed Cyclops, Polyphemus. He has to fight against men at the end of the journey, of course, when he comes face to face with the bad guys. Finally, number two, some kind of homecoming. These journeys, in other words, are not just like, gee, I think I'll take a journey today. Let's go out on a road trip. No, no, no. The epic journey of epic mythology is an epic hero who has a destination. He's going somewhere. Did you notice I keep saying he? Because the epic hero in classic mythology is almost without exception male, never female. Now Odysseus will have a certain kind of relationship to women. And you could make the observation that it's a journey unto himself. <coughs> this relationship that he has with all these different kinds of women, he will spend time with Circe. He ends up for seven years on the island. The beautiful Calypso is there. But these are kind of like conquests that the epic hero has where he gets to be with women. Usually, for Odysseus, it's sexually, right? But we have in this motif the idea that you have an epic hero male going on a long journey where he's going to engage in all these battles, all these challenges, suffering, etc., etc., and finally make it to the Ithaca homeland where he arrives, and then he kind of sets everything safe and, and, and uh, you know, in order. That's the Greek poem for your notes, the Odyssey. Years later, when the Romans run the known world, a great poet named Virgil will play the exact same theme again, uh, thing again, and the epic motif again will be played with the classic hero Aeneas in the epic poem, the Aeneid, A-E-N-E-I-D. You want that in your notes, okay? We continue with this motif in epic poetry. Dante will write his classic, The Divine Comedy, where he imagined as a, as a traveling pilgrim, will take a long journey of three parts. Guess what? Part one is through hell, inferno. You'll remember, we mentioned this already when we were talking about those lines that are quoted right before the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Dante takes a journey first through hell, then through, through purgatory, <coughs> and finally through paradise, paradisio, right? In the English tradition, Milton writes a famous epic poem called Paradise Lost, where the hero of that poem, the hero of that poem, Satan, will take a journey out of hell, pandemonium, into Eden, where he will tempt Eve with that forbidden fruit, explaining, of course, the downfall of man and all of that. In your senior year, you will study Milton's Paradise Lost. 
The challenge, of course, is to define the epic motif in the 20th century. So let's turn now and make a quick observation there. By the 20th century, writers are beginning to play games with this motif. Now, I say play games. Some have called it deconstruct. In other words, they take the motif, but they somehow change parts of the motif. But while they change parts of the motif, for example, A Worn Path is a story <coughs> about not an epic hero male, but an old woman who goes on a walking trip through the woods. Now let's just say this out loud. My student of years ago, on one count, was dead on right. This is a boring story. Conversely, the Odyssey is not a boring story. It's full of high kinds of drama, contests, and all of that. In Eudora Welty's offering, the journey is going to be way more subtle, way more sophisticated, we might say, and yet at the same time, way more simple. So as we get into the story, we want to set ourselves up to be looking for this kind of thing. Now, of course, the hero's quest, and I'm reading with you on page 846. Now I've reviewed a whole bunch of this. Let's take a look. The hero's quest is one archetypical plot structure. Classic quest tales from ancient Egyptian myths to the modern day Star Wars stories typically follow a certain structure and share certain elements. Let's read them. The hero is on a journey to obtain something of great value. We've mentioned it. The hero encounters obstacles that test his or her character. Normally it's his. The hero overcomes these obstacles while obstacles, often with the aid of others, often at great sacrifice. The great sacrifice part I would definitely write down. The hero receives a boon, a benefit that is used to help others, a reward of some kind. The hero's quest symbolizes the larger journey of life. Now we'll say this at 3A later when we make relationship observations. Of course, one of the classic types of, types of Texas way is Pilgrim's Progress displaying, for example, a religious life as a long journey. We think as well in that kind of spiritual religious tradition of the alchemist, maybe a title that some of you are familiar with, but there's going to be a whole lot of these titles in the 20th century that will play the same game of the journey. If you'll think about it, we've already been playing that game to some degree in our 20th century writers. For example, the opening lines of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then you and I when the evening has spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon our table. Let's take a journey, right? Of course, that journey for Prufrock is not the journey of a hero, do I dare disturb the universe, <coughs> but the journey of someone who is putting on his coat as death holds his coat and death begins to snicker at him, right? He even says it. I am not Prince Hamlet nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord. He, he identifies himself with Polonius. Here, we're going to recognize that Welty is playing a classic game of identification with the ancient journey motif. As the title suggests, A Worn Path, I'm back now reading on 846. As, a title, as its title suggests, A Worn Path features a traveler on a familiar road. Phoenix Jackson is her name. An elderly black woman in Depression-era Mississippi faces a range of obstacles as she progresses through the landscape. Some of these obstacles are physical, some are societal. As you read, notice elements in the story that mirror the structure of the hero's quest archetype. By the way, your reading strategy here says to generate questions and make predictions. Of course, your little sidebar there, that little graphic can help you do that. And you have four <laughs> vocabulary words that are now helping you to uh, be able to prepare for the examination. You're going to see those four words. Let's go ahead and turn now to 849 and the building background information on 849 as we get ready to read this text. The story is set in Mississippi during the Great Depression in the 1930s. I would write that down. Decades after the end of the Civil War, and the emancipation of southern slaves, the people of Mississippi still suffered from the social and economic consequences of the war. Many whites continued to reject the idea of a biracial society, and most blacks, though free, quote unquote, had become trapped in a tenant farming system that kept them perpetually indebted to the white landowners. It was not a prosperous system for anyone, black or white. By the onset of the Depression in 1929, Mississippi was among the poorest states in the nation with an average annual income of $287 per capita. Go ahead and read that line again. 
dollars a year. The amount of money that you drop on your cell phone was the amount of money one person could make in an entire year in Mississippi. Now, of course, we've got to consider inflation, no question. But you will agree with me, 287 bones is not a lot of Scooby Snack. You agree with me. That is to say we are dealing in a time of tremendous poverty. Right? Keep reading. By 1933, that average had fallen to, some of my students can't believe this number, $117 a year. A year. That's it. That's what you lived on for a year. Whoa. Families, of course, you can imagine, struggled to make ends meet in a state that could offer neither financial aid nor social services. This is the economic and social landscape through which Venus Jackson travels. And of course, the opening lines of the story, it was December. Before we now turn to the story, let's make one more observation, and this is important again in 2B. You notice how often we will begin our study at 2B, right? That is to say that rhetorical part. Now, I've been waiting to make this observation about the names of characters until now. So let's go ahead really quickly and jot down something at 2B about the naming of characters. Proof Rock, that's a strange name. Notice the name of the heroine in the story of Catherine Ann Porter. The jiltering of who? Granny who? Weatherall. Weatherall? Well, to weather the storm means that you get through it. To weather all means lots of struggles. And of course, we know in that story that Granny Weatherall endured not just the jilting, but the living with the jilting for the rest of her life. Here, the title of our, the name of our character is Phoenix Jackson. Now, Jackson, we know, of course, is representative of, again, Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi. So with that makes some sense for us. But let's now ask about the name Phoenix. As one of my juniors once said, she named her character after that town in Arizona? Well, not so quick. The town in Arizona is, of course, named Phoenix, no question. But what is up with this Phoenix? Now, if you don't know about Phoenix... You should type it into your phone and get yourself some Google images really quickly. Or quickly, you should go online and just Google the history of this word. It is an important word. What is it about? Two things. One, mythology. It comes from the ancient mythic tradition. What mythic tradition? Two, a story about a bird. A bird that lives to go to be very, very old. When the bird gets really old, it builds a nest. It lays down in the nest. It sits there in the nest, and right before it dies, it ignites into fire. It burns itself up out of the ashes of that bird comes a new bird, a young bird. The phoenix is a symbol for rejuvenation, restoration, resurrection. Out of the ashes, and some of you have even heard that phrase, out of the ashes will come the new. That's the mythology of the phoenix. So to name the old woman in our story, Phoenix Jackson, is already setting us up to a very subtle kind of statement about who this heroine will be. Now at level one, and we're about to read the story now with professional reader. Now at level one, I want you to make a quick observation. If this is a story about a journey, an odyssey, down a worn path, worn here obviously suggesting that Phoenix Jackson has walked this before, we want to ask a couple of questions, so write these down at level one. Number one, while she takes her journey, what are the major obstacles that she encounters? Some of them are physical, some of them are societal, as we read. Okay? 
So as she goes through the journey, she won't be fighting against a polyphemus one-eyed giant like Odysseus. She won't be taking a trip down into the underworld the way Odysseus did to meet Tiresias or the way Aeneas does to meet his father. But she nonetheless takes a journey and that journey is understood in stages. So as you're reading the story, jot down at level one what those stages are. By the way, this is a great way to prepare for the exam too because you're going to have some questions about what specifically actually happens in the story. Number two, we have to ask this question. Why? is Phoenix Jackson on this trip. Why? We know why Odysseus is on his trip back to Ithaca. He needs to get home to his fair wife Penelope and his son Telemachus. He needs to restore order because all those nasty bad, bad guy suitors are trying to take over his, his kingdom, right? We understand that Aeneas is taking a journey because he is going to found the great city of Rome, ultimately. We understand that Dante is taking a journey because he is lost in a dark wood, we're told at the beginning. We understand why Satan takes his journey in Paradise Lost because he is still trying to defeat God and, you know, make the, God's creation fall. Okay? we got to ask, why does she take this journey? Does she just get up one morning and decide, you know what, I'm a really old lady, but I'm going to walk through the woods anyway? Or, rather, is there a purpose to her journey and you will want to write the word, what is the purpose, and underline the word purpose, what is the purpose of her journey? Now in the end, we're going to come back to this question at 3B, and that is the question about how we interpret this story, exegete the story, in regards to Eudora Welty's optimism or her hope. Let's now turn to the story itself, and we will be working now. Again, I challenge you. Read every word of this story with our reader. Don't just listen. You could do that when you were five, six years old at kindergarten.